Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Hello there, this is Dee, and welcome to episode 46 of the Benzo Free Podcast. <laughs> I feel like it's been a long, long time since I talked with you. Even though I released three podcast episodes while I was gone, I recorded them at least three weeks ago, so it's been a while for me since since I've sat here in my studio and chatted with you. And on that note, I'm back. I'm back from the trip. Yay! It was an adventure. And like most trips, some things went well, <laughs> some things went poorly, and some were plain unexpected, but I rolled with it and I did okay. I recorded a lot of audio during the trip, mostly thoughts I had on the road. I also recorded some ambient nature sounds and other sounds for our moment of peace and other things for the podcast, but the one thing I didn't record were conversations with you. I'm sorry about that. Two things happened here. One, I did meet with a couple of people on the trip, but none that I could record. And second, much like most of my road trips, things changed. <laughs> Our plans changed mid-trip, and we had to return to Kansas City for a couple of days instead of heading a different direction. As they say, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. That's <laughs> not a literal translation from Burns, but anyway, things went awry. So I apologize to everyone who voiced interest in meeting up. I really appreciated the feedback, and I feel like I let you down. If any of you are in Colorado, please let me know. On a visit or seeing family or the holidays, whatever, I would love to meet up. And I promise this is not the last road trip. But all is not lost, not by a long shot. I still recorded a lot of material on this. I don't know how it came out. I'm hoping some of it is even halfway decent. I still have to go through those audio recordings and and um, see what I have. I, I'm not going to share it today in this podcast since I still have to organize it, edit it, turn it into a podcast episode. I'd like to download some pictures so I can post a few on the website to go along with it. So I still got work to do and it's going to take me another week to put that together. So I hope next week, fingers crossed, it will be ready to go. But overall, the trip was good and I did most of the things on the trip that I wanted to, including on vacation. Unfortunately, I was also reminded of my limitations from protracted withdrawal more often than I hoped. <laughs> and it got to me on occasion. In fact, I returned with a sense of sadness when I got home due, due to a lot of factors, including some I still haven't even identified, <laughs> I think. But, but I'm doing a little better now as I try to return to a sense of routine here at home. But I do want to share one takeaway from the trip with you today. This is the first trip that I've really dedicated time to recording audio throughout the entire trip. I still took a lot of pictures and even some video, which I have always done along the way, too much so to be honest in the past. But recording just audio was different. Sometimes I would record my thoughts, as I did with the previous trip, and that felt wonderful. It, it truly felt like you were with me. So thanks for that. Other times I just recorded ambient sounds, especially on hikes of the birds, the leaves, the streams and rivers, even a train in the distance, or the, the sound of a woodpecker pounding away on a giant oak. Anything I could find, I'd pull out the recorder and I'd start recording some things. You see, I wanted some ambient sounds of our own to share during our meditation so I wasn't always downloading them and using other people's recordings. And I found more than I was looking for, I think. 
Haven't listened to them yet, but I think we got some good stuff. But the real surprise with this was that recording audio forced me to stop and just be. It was meditative for me. And I noticed so much more than I ever have before. The sounds of nature are amazing. And I've always been too focused on my destination, on getting there, or even on watching everything to pay attention. When I'm recording audio, I'm intentionally listening to everything going on, just like we've done in some of our meditations. Part of that is that I want to make sure I get a clean recording. And trust me, this is not easy to do. (laughs) One of the things I noticed the most was how much man-made sounds are everywhere. You can be a few miles off on a trail in the middle of the woods and you still get man-made sounds. Airplanes are a big one of those. It's really hard, especially in the U.S., to go anywhere and not have the sound of airplanes cutting into your recording. But once I could eliminate some of the man-made intrusions, I could really focus in and hear the sounds of nature. It was a real intimate experience. So recording the audio in different places for this podcast, including recording the thoughts and recording ambient sounds, the one thing that that did for me was it forced me to slow down and not focus on the destination, but be in the moment and just listen. I, I look forward to sharing with you some of those thoughts and some of those sounds that I recorded, and, and those will be coming up in, a, in an episode here shortly. And now I'm back home and getting things back to normal. Lots of laundry, catching up on emails, going through the mail, and planning this week's podcast, which, as you know, I am now recording. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm doing, as you probably can tell. Anyway, this is Thanksgiving week, so for those of you in the U.S., happy Thanksgiving. I hope you are able to spend it with your family, friends, people you love, whoever you value in your life. I hope you have a chance to spend this holiday with them. In fact, I'd like to ask you a favor, just one simple favor, throughout Thanksgiving. Yes, I know it's typical to always say, give thanks, and I think that's key. (laughs) But that's not where I'm going here. The favor I'm asking here is to try and enjoy it, or at least part of it. Don't let the symptoms, the anxiety, the anger, the hopelessness ruin everything in your life. Take a break this holiday. And enjoy it as much as you can. Even if you can't eat the food, enjoy the company. And if you can enjoy the company, then enjoy the quiet away from the company. Enjoy the solitude if that's what you have. Either way, try and take a break from the ruminations and negative potholes in your brain. And enjoy what's around you. Just for a few minutes if that's all you can do. But let a little bit of that positive energy, of that light, shine in on your life just for a little while. And speaking of Thanksgiving and traveling to see family, today here in beautiful Colorado, we are under a winter storm warning. I went out and shoveled about three inches last night. I just shoveled about seven or eight this morning. We've gotten about a foot so far, and we're expecting another four or five. So so this may be about a foot and a half in the end. This is not uncommon for us. And if you are not traveling, it can be totally beautiful. But if you're not traveling in it, or if you don't have shelter like that, I get it. This is a nightmare. So please be safe out there. If you're traveling around this country or anywhere in the world, this holiday in the U.S. or whatever holidays you got coming up in other parts of the world, be safe and allow yourself time to work around the weather. Today we will have a slightly altered format, which will have our introduction, mailbag, and Benzo story, but there's no feature today. Instead, I decided to focus on our mailbag and Benzo stories and extend them a little bit. We have three items in the mailbag and three separate stories to share, and they're really good ones. The truth be told, I just got back from almost three weeks on the road, and I've, I've been swamped trying to catch up since my return. Thus, 
instead of researching a new topic for this week's podcast, I decided to let you all do the work and do the driving via your comments, questions, and stories. So yes, this is a little easier for me to prepare than doing research for a feature, but also I think it's a really great topic, and that is let's focus on your stories, your comments, your questions for an episode, because that's really what this podcast is about. I hope you like it. And we still need feedback, as always. Questions, comments, stories, suggestions, corrections, additions, anything you can think of, anything you want to send my way, the kitchen sink, a hot fudge sundae, picture of your dog or cat or a parrot or a weasel or emu, I don't care. <laughs> or if it's just to say, I am so blessed. It is Thanksgiving here in the U.S., so, you know, if you want to send me something that says what you're grateful for, what you're thankful for, I'd love to hear that too. Whatever it is, send it my way. Visit our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback or email us at podcast at benzofree.org or comment directly on the podcast blog itself for others to see. And don't forget to sign up for our mailing list at benzofree.org slash subscribe. And one last thing. The Benzo Free Podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. If you are listening to this podcast on one of our providers, please leave feedback on that carrier. This does help new listeners find us. Okay, let's move on. Let's get back to our mailbag. And can I just say something really quickly before we move on? It's really great to be here talking to you again today. I've missed this. Anyway, our mailbag. Today we have two questions and one comment to share. Our first question is from Frank in White Plains, New York. Frank asks, has anyone experienced dysgeusia, terrible taste, while detoxing? Thanks for the question, Frank. Dysgeusia, also known as paragusia, is a distortion of the sense of taste. Hypersensitivity to sight, sound, touch, smell, and yes, taste is very common in benzodependence and withdrawal. This can show itself as unexpected tastes, including foul tastes. A metallic taste is also very common. Studies have shown that hundreds of medications have a chemosensory side effect on our sense of taste and smell, often unpleasant to the patient. This is often caused by alterations in the transduction pathways, biochemical target, enzymes, and transporters by the various drugs. So yes, Frank, it is definitely possible that your strange altered taste sensations are due to your benzo withdrawal. Our next question is from Rubiat in Denmark. Rubiat asks, Hi D. Does sauna therapy help to reduce PWS or make it worse? I love getting unique questions like this. The truth is, I had no idea how to answer this question when I received it. I didn't even know about sauna use as therapy. So, like I always do, I looked into it. First off, sauna therapy can mean a couple different things. It can mean just the use of a standard dry heat sauna, the one we most often think about. Now, this can be risky for some heart patients, and they should check with their doctors. But according to an article in Medical News Today, it is relatively safe for most people. In this article, the author quoted Dr. Harvey Simon, editor-in-chief of Harvard Men's Health Watch, who said, quote, All in all, saunas appear safe for the body but there is little evidence that they have health benefits above and beyond relaxation and a feeling of well-being. But patients with poorly controlled blood pressure, abnormal heart rhythms, unstable angina, and advanced heart failure or heart valve disease will probably be advised to stay cool. Now, now as for people like us going through benzo withdrawal who want to try the dry heat sauna therapy, are there complications? I don't know. But if it helps you relax and feel better and you don't have an underlying health condition, it might be beneficial. But just keep in mind that much like Dr. Simon said, there's little evidence to show that it has health benefits. So be cautious and don't overdo it. 
Now, sauna therapy can also refer to infrared saunas. And this is a popular spa treatment claiming to detox your body. These saunas use infrared light to heat the body from within, rather than heating the air from without, as a traditional sauna does. Many celebrities have claimed the benefits of these saunas, such as the Kardashians, Gwyneth Paltrow, Chelsea Handler, and even Dr. Oz. The practitioners of these infrared saunas claim that they produce a sweat with a higher percent of toxins than normal sweat and claim it is seven times more detoxifying than traditional heat. One of these facilities also claims that during the fight or flight response, which, as we all know, is an almost constant state for many of us in benzo withdrawal, that our body doesn't release toxins during this time. So, does that mean that if we are always in this state that our toxins are building up inside of us? Well, I turned to a 2017 article in The Atlantic by Kelly Conaboy for an in-depth look at this trend. The title of the article is, Infrared Saunas Will Not Detoxify You. <laughs> by the title of this article, you might see where this is going. <laughs> I put a link to the article in our show notes. The author of the article interviewed Dr. Anna Glazer, dermatology professor at St. Louis University and president of the International Hyperhidrosis Society, which is the medical term for excessive sweating. First off, regarding the claim that during the fight or flight response that we don't release toxins, Dr. Glazer responded, quote, But I have not at all, in my years as a physician, ever heard that your body doesn't release toxins in fight or flight. But that being said, what about the claim that infrared saunas increase our output of toxins, making our bodies more healthy? To this, Dr. Glazer responded, quote, In general, sweat can release some toxins and some chemicals, but that is not really sweat's major job. The organs responsible for detoxifying our system are the kidneys and the liver. Those two do such a good job that really, sweat doesn't need to do that. So, for most people, sweating a lot does not detoxify them at all, because the kidneys are doing it. Sweat's main job is to keep us cool. Now, I don't want to go into any more detail on this. If you want to read the article, visit our link in the show notes. But the author did do her due diligence in trying to track down evidence of the claims of these infrared sauna centers with no real findings. As for helping benzo withdrawal, well, of course I'm not a medical expert, so this is all layman's opinion. But since most of the healing in withdrawal is usually focused on the central and peripheral nervous systems, I'm not sure how sweating out extra toxins helps us heal from benzos. Maybe it does, but that's just my opinion. Take it or leave it. Well, I hope this helped a bit with the dilemma, and thanks for the question, Frank. And closing out our mailbag, we have a comment from Denise in New Mexico. Denise shared her story with me about a week ago, and I will include it in its entirety in an upcoming episode on the podcast. But for now, I want to focus on two sentences from her story. Denise said, I practice a guided yoga nidra meditation. It's a sleep-based meditation, and it's pretty amazing for help with sleep issues. Only about a week after I read Denise's story, I was listening to my playlist of guided meditations on my phone, which I often do, and guess what came up? Yoga Nidra. I've listened to it before, and many of the practices within it I have used in my recovery, but I didn't remember the term, the, the name Yoga Nidra, so I didn't tie the two together when I got Denise's story. Anyway, I thought it was of interest, and I wanted to include it here. First off, yoga nidra is not really meditation per se. In meditation, the goal is concentration. That's the key, learning to focus and maintain focus. In yoga nidra, the goal is to help reach a state of near sleep or even sleep itself. Still, the name is not key here. Sleep is something that almost all of us struggle with during benzo withdrawal. Yoga Nidra's intention is to help us enter a state of yogic sleep, 
which is a state of consciousness between waking and sleeping. A state I often fall into when I meditate, even if I'm not intending to do so, especially if I meditate when lying down, which I do on occasion. Our brains have four categories of brain waves, ranging from the most active to the least active. Beta are the fastest of the waves and are common in a strongly engaged mind. Alpha waves are slower, a common state during relaxation or meditation. Theta brain waves are even slower than alpha and happens when you start to daydream. It is common with people who are driving but can't recall how they reach their destination. <laughs> I know that one. <laughs> it's also common with marathon runners or when you're in the shower or even brushing your hair or teeth. And the last is delta. This is the state of deep sleep. In yoga nidra or yogic sleep, our brains shift from beta, which has a lot of brain activity, to alpha, a more relaxed state, and even into theta sometimes. People who spend more time in beta brain wave activity are often more anxious. People who spend more time in alpha brain wave activity are usually less anxious. That sounds like a good thing. <laughs> if somebody gave me the choice, I'd choose alpha. But I know beta is where my mind is most of the time. But then again, theta is common for me too when I find myself just daydreaming. But back to Yoga Nidra. According to the website, Yoga International, and yes, I put a link to this resource in our show notes, Yoga Nidra is, quote, an immensely powerful meditation technique and one of the easiest yoga practices to develop and maintain. The entire practice of Yoga Nidra is usually done in Shavasana, or corpse pose. For those of you who have never done yoga, it's basically lying on your back, totally relaxed. My favorite position, actually. <laughs> I've often asked my yoga instructor if we could do 60 minutes of Shavasana, and they laugh as if it's funny. Anyway, this practice is almost always a guided practice, so there is a voice throughout the experience to lead you through the steps. It can be as short as five minutes or as long as an hour, and many practice it as their nighttime ritual before falling asleep, but still others do do it during the day and do not fall into actual state of sleep, but still benefit from the relaxing benefits of this practice, and it helps them with their sleep later that night. Another common goal of Yoga Nidra is to dive deep within yourself and help you explore your deep emotions without becoming overwhelmed by them. It can help relieve samskara, or your mental grooves. These are the mental impressions caused by repetitive thoughts or habits, we all know those really well, <laughs> which can cause negative reactions and emotions. We've talked about similar practices throughout this podcast, although not necessarily in the practice of yoga or meditation. Yoga International lists five key benefits to Yoga Nidra, and I'm going to paraphrase them here really quickly for you. One, anyone can do it. Two, you cannot do it wrong. Three, it is easy to incorporate into your daily life. Four, it's a simple way to reduce stress. That's a great one. And five, you learn about yourself intimately. Another really good benefit. If you want to learn more about this practice, take a look at the articles I've listed in our show notes or do a search for Yoga Nidra on the web. It's spelled Yoga, Y-O-G-A, Nidra, N-I-D-R-A. I'm sure you will find several guided recordings there that you can try out. In fact, in our moment of peace today, we will do a very short version of Yoga Nidra, just as a sample. Even though we won't have enough time to truly get into a near sleep state, it'll give you a taste of what this practice is like. Thanks for the comment, Denise. This was a great subject to share here. And that closes out our mailbag. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback to share, please visit our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback or email us at podcast at benzofree.org. And now, on to our Benzo stories. Today we have three stories. I've been getting more stories lately, and I love it. Thank you so much for sharing them with us. As wonderful as they are written, many of them are also equally hard to hear. Still, 
I believe that sharing our stories is critical to our healing. Each of today's stories, despite their negative subject matter, I believe are hopeful. I wanted to keep with that theme today and share a little positive attitude and success. If you sent your story in and haven't heard it on the podcast yet, please don't worry, it's coming. I I have a month or two of stories now in the queue and I do try to share them in the order they are received. So please keep them coming. I still love to get them and it's great to have content to share on this podcast. So enough of that, let's get right to the stories. Our first story is from Kathy in Phoenix, Arizona. Kathy writes, My story is still unfolding. Never in my life would I have thought one tiny little pill would pack such a profound wallop. But before I even start on my experience, thank you so much for your podcast. It is a great comfort. More people would share if the shaming wasn't so prevalent. It it is a shame there is a stigma to this benzo challenge, as the vast majority of us are not addicts. We follow doctor's orders. We never bought drugs on the street, but relied on a doctor's advice and their long-term prescription. I was never warned of dependence. Years upon years of Ativan to Xanax to Valium. Years. When I finally reached tolerance, nothing worked anymore. And hell opened up before me, reaching an agoraphobic apex at a Christmas cabin in Flagstaff. All I could do was shake and suffer tremors and terror while everyone else enjoyed Christmas. The snow fell, and so did my hopes for any semblance of normalcy. The dear doctor thought that an SSRI would help, as I must have an escalating anxiety disorder. Each SSRI we tried was a disaster. Each had a paradoxical reaction. Anxiety escalated. I weaned off five before the doctor finally believed that an antidepressant was not for me. I just want your listeners to know that it is my opinion, not advice, that polydrugging is something you really need to think through. It was the wrong treatment for me. I have crossed over to Valium from Xanax, which was brutal. I have cut from 40 milligrams to 4.5 milligrams Valium. And I am committed to ride this pony all the way to the finish line to zero. Along the way, the last 18 months were myriad symptoms from hell itself palpitations for days, tachycardia, blood pressure spikes, terror, insomnia, dizziness, agoraphobia, derealization, gut issues, and a host of others. There were days I was sure my body would give out. I cried. I prayed. I asked for hugs. But I did not fade away. Another day passed. And as I seek that magic balance between cut amount and rate of regenerative healing, I also have you and meditation and yoga and exercise and and good nutrition and hydration in my toolkit. My Benzo warriors are going to make it. Every day we are healing, sometimes imperceptibly, but our malleable brains will carry us through. Sometimes this podcast brings me back from the ledge of despair. I I will keep you posted on progress. Please do not stop reaching out, D. Your friend, Kathy. Wow, thanks for sharing that, Kathy. I just teared up reading that one. <laughs> That's not scripted. That's just me. That was really well written, Kathy. And oh, you you ended on such a positive message and note. Thank you for that. You you've been through so much, but I love your attitude and your toolbox sounds wonderful. Great job and great advice for others. You can hear the crack in my voice. I'm just going to leave this. In. <laughs> Oh, please do send us an update as your healing progresses. I really want to hear how you're doing. 
You are doing great. And please, please keep in touch. Thank you so much, Kathy. I really appreciate your story. Our second story today is from David in Japan. We shared a comment from David in episode 44 titled, A Conversation with Dr. Christy Huff, Part 1. His comment was about benzo mornings and how he has found that getting out of bed and being active is the best solution. He also talked about being the observer, especially when it comes to observing his own anxious thoughts. But that was a more recent comment from David. Let's go back now and hear David's story. David writes, I have been in Japan since 1974. I came here as a 24-year-old with a head full of dreams and stayed. I've had quite an interesting lifestyle for all these years, running a small company dealing with film and digital lenses. The taper is a beast. I try not to fixate. The Ashton method is the way to go. Drop 10% every 10 to 14 days. If withdrawal is bumpy, hold, but never updose. I take a daily multivitamin, eat even when I am nauseous, and generally try to carry on as normal. I, I don't make promises for meetings, as this sometimes stresses me out not knowing how I'm going to feel. But despite this, I usually get through with whatever I have to accomplish, even if my mind is racing. I guess it's all about acceptance. Having faith that life will at some point return to normal. My psychiatrist is not particularly familiar with tapers or the Ashton method. I directed him to the Ashton Japanese website. I have no idea if he bothered to look at it. I may print it out for him, which would then kind of force him to read it. Before my appointments, I visit the pharmacist, who is an angel. She basically writes on a piece of paper what we decide the dosage should be, and I give it to the doctor. The pharmacist understands that I am doing this slowly and is prepared to make up any amount in a powder dosage. I try to keep active, even when the demons come out to play. I have a treadmill in my office and do at least 30 minutes on it in the morning before breakfast and my first medication of the day. Exercise is definitely the key to calming the mind. I have a border collie. She and I go for long walks on the trails near my house. I, I have to wear a bell, like my dog does too, as there are sometimes bears about, although in 36 years I have never seen one. I also practice mindfulness. Right now I am doing a course by Sam Harris. You may know of him. A taper is a lonely task. My wife is kind, but I try not to show when things are bad. There is nothing that anyone can do. I just grin and bear it. Sometimes I succumb to crying fits and self-pity, but this doesn't last for long. The, the anxiety is up and down, but it's only anxiety. And as I know the cause, which although doesn't make it better, I know I am not going crazy, and it too will pass. It's good to have your podcasts. I am only on number seven, but just someone out there knowing what I am going through is reassuring. I looked into Benzo Buddies in the UK, where I am from. This was a great help on my first taper, which was six to seven years ago. The first taper was pretty long, but only from 0.4 milligrams of Mogadon, crossing over to Valium, the dreaded V. After I completed the taper, I had very few symptoms, nothing really protracted to speak of. Hopefully the same will apply this time. I consider myself agnostic. However, someone once said, God only gives us as much as you can take in terms of suffering. This may be true. Thanks for being there. Best wishes, David. Wow, thank you so much for your story, David. Da David and I have emailed a few times back and forth and even shared a few photos with each other. He's a great guy, and I really like chatting with him. I'm, 
I'm always fascinated by people who live in different parts of the world, and I'm, I'm so glad David shared his experiences with us today. It's amazing how we build our support teams in a mismatched way sometimes. David has a doctor that helps him, but his pharmacist is the one that really kind of helps him decide his dosage, and they work together as this team. And, and sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes we have to mismatch and put together different professionals and different people to create our support network. David has a lot of wisdom in his emails, and it's been an asset to my work here at Benzo Free. I, I wish him well and really hope he keeps in touch. Thanks, David. I really appreciate your input. Take care, and, and we'll talk soon. And our final story is from Linda in Christchurch, New Zealand. And this is an update story, just like I mentioned before. I love update stories. Most of the time, we don't get to share the happy endings quite as often. That doesn't mean that they don't happen. Most of the time, they do. But I understand that once people are benzo-free, and return to the exciting world out there, it, it can be hard to revisit this experience and share it with others. So when someone like Linda takes the time to let us know how she is doing, it's cause for celebration. Linda first shared her story in episode 19, yes, way back in episode 19, titled Relationship, Intimacy, and Sex in Benzo Withdrawal. Yes, that was the spicy one. <laughs> the only episode of Benzo Free Podcast so far, which had to have a parental advisory on it. Okay, actually it probably didn't need the advisory, it was pretty tame. Perhaps we will cover some topics down the line, which may require... A legitimate parental advisory. But anyway, let me just tell you a bit about Linda. Linda moved back to New Zealand in 2007 after living in the United Kingdom for 14 years. She had taken Ativan for years, sometimes mixed it with alcohol, and had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. She even spent a week in a hospital dealing with clinical depression. She also lost her job and was severely cognitively impaired much of the time. Well, that was the beginning. Now, let's hear the update. Linda writes, You read out my sad story to your listeners about five months ago. My story since then has changed dramatically. I have turned my life around since coming off benzos. I was on them for perhaps six years, lorazepam and diazepam. My memory is still a bit shot, but it's a ton better than it was. I lived between benzos. I cried when I ran out. I slept most of the time and was depressed and anxious most of the time. What happened as I came off them was like I came alive. I could remember things. I felt things. I felt love again for life and people. I thought about what I was going to do. I, I was too out of it to even think about that before. And I decided I would do a CELTA course, Certificate in English Language Teaching to Adults. It was 11 weeks of the most intense, hard study. I could never in a million years have done that on benzos. The course finished six weeks ago, and now I'm a relief teacher on a refugee and migrant program. Can you believe it? Now, this didn't just come out of the blue. I studied languages at school, and I was reasonably bright until I was on benzos. It's like I've come back to myself. I've woken up. In January of this year, I was drinking in the morning and taking lorazepam three times a day. That was rock bottom, and I was on the way out, heading toward accidental or deliberate overdose. I don't know how, but I decided to do something about it. I couldn't work. I just lost a job because I couldn't remember anything. I switched to diazepam because it's easier to come off with the longer half-life of it. But I hated it. Lorazepam, I loved. I cut down a quarter every two weeks. I, I went to AA, and that worked with my drinking. It was so hard for five months. But now... I feel so good, and I get to help refugees speak English. 
Some women have never even held a pen in their lives. I can help them to become part of New Zealand society by teaching them English. And I've got a place in the world again. To your listeners, please, please persevere. Switch to diazepam if you choose because it's long-lasting. Cut down like D says, very slowly. Mine, I guess, was fast, quarter every two weeks. Don't go faster than that. Have faith in it. It's worth the short-term pain for getting your life back. Never mind about being pissed off with doctors, although I was enraged at times. But never mind that now. Get off that stuff and back to you and your possibilities in life. D, thank you for your Benzo Free podcast. I did it with you. There on air, like a loving friend. Love, Linda. Wow, okay, I'm going again. <laughs> Sorry. I am very tearful today, but in a really good way. <laughs> I get these emotions back and sometimes they just pour out of me. I just love stories like this. Thank you so much, Linda, for coming back to us to share your success. It means so much to everyone who still struggles with benzo use and dependence. These are the stories that we need to hear. This was a wonderful story to share, and I'm so grateful to you for taking the time to send it to us. Please, write back again later and keep us informed. I'm, I'm so happy for your success. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, David. And thank you, Linda. This is what this podcast is all about. And don't forget, we still need stories. And even though I have a month to two in the queue, I still would love to have some more. And I promise I'll share them in the order I got them in. Just go to our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback or email us at podcast at benzofree.org. And don't forget, you can also do it in your own voice if you like. There are instructions for that on our feedback form. And now, before we get on to our moment of peace... Yes, we need just 30 seconds. Hang on for our disclaimer. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical health or psychological advice nor any other kind of personal professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benson Free Podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering on any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. And that brings us to our closing, our moment of peace. It's just one minute, and it's an opportunity to quiet your mind a bit before you return to the chaos of the real world. Today's meditation will be a bit longer than one minute, though and will be a guided meditation. I hope you will enjoy it. Please remember that you should only do this if you are in a safe place, where you can close your eyes, relax, and let the world pass by without you for a minute or two. Since today's meditation can induce a sleep or near-sleep state, it is really important to do this in a safe place. Today we are going to try a brief sample of Yoga Nidra, as we introduced in our mailbag. Since we are limited on time, it won't be a full meditation, but perhaps it will give you a brief taste and interest you enough to learn more. The best position for today's meditation is Shavasana, which is lying flat on your back, legs straight and relaxed, arms by your side so you can feel the ground below you supporting your entire body. You can also use a bolster to slightly raise your head and torso if you like with your pelvis and legs still on the ground. And if you can't lie down, this can also be done in a seated position, if you prefer. 
like all forms of yoga and meditation, there are many variations of yoga nidra. We will present just one abbreviated form today. Others dive deeper into your feelings and emotions and thoughts. You might want to check those out on your own. Let's get started. Close your eyes and relax. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly. Let's do that again. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly along with all the stress of the day. One more time. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let the breath out slowly, relaxing your entire body. Now just breathe slowly and naturally. the weight of your body to connect with the ground beneath you. Now focus on a desire for today's meditation. Perhaps it is for health or well-being. Perhaps it is for healing. Or today maybe it is for sleep. Find your inner calm, that place inside of you where you feel safe, relaxed, and removed from the worries of every day. Now scan your body from head to toe, looking for places of tension. Scan the top of your head, your eyes, your nose, your face, your mouth your jaw, your neck, and on and on, working all the way down to your toes. When you find a place of tension, breathe deeply three times into that part of your body. Relaxing all the tension from that space, easing your tired and worn muscles, and returning that area to rest. As you continue to move down your body, allow all feelings and sensations permeate you without judgment. Welcome them. Experience them. They can't hurt you. They are just feelings. Whether they are happiness, joy, elation and relaxation, or fear, sadness, worry, anger, or even hate. 
just experience them. If you get caught in a negative emotion, follow it up with a positive one. Such as if you feel anger towards someone, follow it with love towards another. But remember to welcome all sensations. Allow the feelings to come and go. Continue this process for one minute. As you return to your waking state, take a moment to reflect on this experience and try and take a little of this practice with you into your daily life. Next episode is episode 47, and it will be released next Wednesday. Thank you again for joining me today, and please let me know how we did. Keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.